Hi, I'm Neelam Pathakanda. And I'm Susanna Barkataki, and welcome to Radical Resilience. We're two best friends and professionals in wellness and medicine, coming together to tackle some of the most important issues today around health. Today, we're going to explore the connection between far-right conspir- conspiracy theorists who are driving the modern-day anti-vaccine movement and anti-science thought and white supremacy. So for many folks who I know, you may not realize as a well-intentioned, healthy person who wants to eat well, do right by your family, make good choices, that the choices we make and the stances we hold impact not just ourselves, but many more people. And so we really have a responsibility as wellness practitioners, yoga teachers, those in the alternative medicine, health and wellness community to take a clear stand because it's some of us, some of our siblings, some of our colleagues in the health and wellness world that have been some of the greatest advocates feeding misinformation. It's a fringe movement that is becoming more mainstream. We have officials at the highest levels of government, like Senator Marjorie Taylor Greene, who are espousing these views um, that are anti-vaccine, that are anti-COVID, or that COVID is a hoax. And it's really dangerous because not only are millions of people dying of COVID every in the world, uh, it also harms communities unequally. The danger lies along racial lines. The leaders in the anti-vaccine movement are the same people who charged the Capitol. They held multiple rallies at the Capitol leading up to that, um, leading up to the insurrection. The Proud Boys offered them protection. These are, are these people you wanna be taking medical advice from? It's the same people who are showing up at anti-COVID demonstrations, who are claiming COVID is a hoax, who are defying mask mandates who are protesting at vaccine centers. So I'm in Los Angeles and recently there was a bunch of protesters who shut down the largest vaccine operation at Dodger Stadium, potentially allowing many vaccines to go to waste. Mm. This is not who we should be taking medical advice from, in my opinion. What happens is that who's taking the vaccine? There's three times more white folks than people of color taking this vaccine. They've been able to sow seeds of mistrust using along racial lines, using um, the mistrust that people of color have already um, with Western medicine. And I don't think their agenda concerns your health. Hmm. So let's break this down. So QAnon, has been around on the fringes of the internet for the last few years. It's gained traction during the pandemic as people are more isolated and spending more time online. The tropes it uses though are not new. They're anti-Semitic and they focus on a simplified narrative of the purity of the body or a purified nation or purified nation state that should not be defiled. They basically play on fears and sow seeds of mistrust and division division for a political agenda. So your question, do they have your best interest at heart? I'd love to break down how we get from wellness and yoga to white supremacy and conspiracy in 10 steps. And this is important everyone because it's about us. really convenient to think we can separate ourselves off and say, oh, I'm so superior, I'm better than those people who believe these conspiracies. But the thing is, we need to take part, I need to take responsibility for my part in this as well, because there are people just like me uh, who are espousing these views that harm so many people. So let's connect these dots together and also call in the parts of ourselves that may hold some of these beliefs and the people in our communities who may have fallen prey to aspects or dimensions of these views. Here's what I see happening in the wellness world. One, in yoga and wellness in the West, 
as a community, our openness to new ideas and unusual thinking can be great. It's one of the best qualities about our community. But this openness can be paired with a critique and a suspicion of mainstream government and pharmaceutical companies, all of which can make us potentially anti-critical thinking and anti-science. You know, I see this so often, and I think what it is, is a response to medicine, Western medicine, that people perceive as being all head and no heart. Um, and the reaction is equal and opposite in, the op in a different direction. So all heart, no head. This is kind of not the way that the brain works. We think sometimes we're right-brained and maybe we're more creative, more spiritual, or we're left-brained. We're more data-driven or analytic. But when you really look at how the brain works, there's no such thing as right and left brain. We're using all parts of the brain for our creativity, for our spirituality, for our data, and for our analytics. We need to do that here as well, using both our hearts and our minds. So the next step after that suspicion that makes us anti-science is we pair that with a kind of new age magical thinking that is dependent on unvalidated groupthink or peer epistemology. And for those who don't didn't study philosophy, I'll break down epistemology. It's the study of how we know what we know. And how we know what we know often comes from what our friends say or say so, or an article on a blog, one that we haven't researched. You know, when we think about big pharma, we often, it conjures up maybe greedy capitalists, but according to the Global Wellness Institute, the wellness industry is a 4.2 trillion global industry. And most of its growth has been in the last couple of years, honestly. It's three times the growth of the global pharmaceutical industry. So this is like, this is the wellness industrial complex. <laughs> and it oftentimes makes unfounded claims not based in science, oftentimes anecdotal, like what you're saying, or spiritual evidence. And it's often times can be dangerous, maybe not always. But an example, for instance, is zinc, which is really popular. People are taking it right now because of the threat of COVID, but taking too much of it can be really harmful. And if you're taking antibiotics, which is something that you should be taking if you do have COVID or another kind of infection, zinc can reduce the effectiveness of some antibiotics. So you really need to depend on experts because there is some safety built into the system. The honest truth is there is simply no regulatory body when it comes to vitamins and supplements. You simply don't know what you're getting. And the idea that everyone is selling you something out of the goodness of their heart and not trying to make money off of you is also a false narrative. Yes. Now, this ties in very clearly with the next step, which is the propensity for individualistic, capitalistic thinking, narcissism. And that goes with white centering and saviorism, plus a lack of systemic analysis. So when we have all these things working together, we just care about, well, is it good for me? And if it's not good for me, forget the rest of you, I'm not doing it. But it doesn't really work that way in the world never has. And you can probably tell us stories that you've learned about in your research, smallpox or other infectious diseases that we've been able to eradicate in many places because people didn't just think for themselves, they thought for the community, not something we're seeing in high numbers right now. This all dovetails with neo-gnosticism. And folks may not know that word, but many of us in the wellness community act on this belief. Neo-Gnosticism is the idea that we are a chosen, more enlightened spiritual elite. And this can be a problematic concept if we believe it and put ourselves above 
and think that we're better than other people. There's a, a story that this reminds me of when I was pregnant and was in a prenatal yoga class, which was taught by a wonderful woman who was a doula, who um, said to us one day, you can have whatever labor you desire. And I'm here thinking as a physician, that is absolutely not true, that a lot of what we have done is take a very dangerous act, giving birth and try to, to manage it. Um, and what I think is that it's an inherently unpredictable process. I've actually talked to many patients, many mothers who, um, who have healthy babies, but were so grieving because they did not get the labor that they wanted. This idea that we are in control, I think is really harmful because it sets especially pregnant women up, but I think all of us for failure when we live in such an unpredictable world and where we're dealing with unpredictable natural phenomenon. So powerful. And in another podcast, we'll dive into wellness and pregnancy and birthing because there's a lot to unpack there. I was one of those people who, as a pregnant person, I thought I would be able to control so much more than I actually could and bought into a lot of those anti-Western medicine you know, stories. And I see all the sides. And so there is a lot to unpack. But the thing I learned absolutely and for sure is that birth, like death, and like much of life, is really ultimately out of my control. And that control was an illusion. And this is the fifth and sixth step here of this slippery slope from wellness and yoga to con you know, conspiracy and different theories here that we believe because all of these things we're talking about make us more susceptible to see illusions as truth and to grasp at making meaning from random pattern recognition, which I'll come back to with the cue drops, which are ways that the communication comes out randomly. And then it's very empowering in a way because we or the community who's receiving those drops of information has to make meaning themselves. So the narrative is not given, but people make meaning collectively. So it plays back into that group think and self-validation and really narcissistic uh, putting oneself right out in front. Because during the global pandemic, during all this isolation, unprecedented joblessness that we haven't seen you know, in many of our lifetimes, this loss of purpose and meaning makes that desire for control so high. We want an explanation for how can bad things happen? Why are these things happening to us? Why in our lifetimes? Why for our children? Why for our families? And so we want that there to be an explanation. So we'd latch onto these events in ways that seem to make them make sense, which really are conspiracy theories. And we may use or connect to terms that have messages that align for us. And even the messages we believe in, QAnon co-opted the hashtag Save the Children, which is an organization that does really important work around stopping child trafficking and child labor. But they use that hashtag in a way that got into our sensibilities for caring for a re really valid cause, but then used it for something else. The Great Awakening. Well, what yoga practitioner or meditator doesn't want to have a Great Awakening? Do your research, which sounds like it's pushing us in the direction of critical thinking, but wasn't. We awaken together. Um, these are all themes we see in yoga and wellness. We stop. Um, we should say who QAnon is. For those who don't know, the main tenets of QAnon, which is a far-right conspiracy theory, promotes, among other things, the belief that there is an elite cabal of leftists engaging in child trafficking ring. He's, uh, QAnon exists, has existed for a long time, as Susanna was saying, but it's more increasingly mainstream. 
So QAnon has gone from a harmless conspiracy theory that existed on the fringes of society to now being a much more mainstream thought process that has gained momentum from, since Trump got elected and is now in the highest reaches of our government. So here's where we as wellness folks and yoga practitioners, people who believe in natural health and healing go completely awry. We can feel superior while acting in a totally anti-communitarian way. We double down on spiritual bypassing, searching for clues, educating in air quotes here, and toxic positivity, all at the cost of people's lives and potentially suppressing truth and science and ultimately supporting white supremacist views and actions that harm society collectively. And toxic positivity, if you don't know what that means, it's it's really kind of not allowing the negative into your into your belief system. Um, the same way that saying all lives matter ignores the real harm and suffering that's happening to a community uh, because it doesn't agree with your own sense of positivity. Ultimately, it harms that community even more because it disenfranchises them and causes them to feel more invisible. Right. And so our choices and the actions that we take and the information that we share impact far beyond just our own lives and our own families. And I want to be really clear here. I don't think that Western medicine has all the answers. I don't think that it's necessarily a very um, empowering mode of getting healthcare all the time, it can be, but you kind of have to work at it. I agree with many of the critiques that people have of Western medicine. What I don't agree with is throwing the whole thing out because of a bad experience or because your neighbor says something different or because your yoga teacher explained it to you this way. There is room for experts in our society and there is room for intellectualism. And I think at the heart of anti-science is an anti-intellectualism. Some of what that is from is just feeling like our decisions are only gonna impact us, as you were saying, Susanna. It's a very individualistic mindset. And honestly, I think it's based on a settler colonial mindset of like, you know, going out in this country and having to kind of make it your own way, ignoring the people who were there before us, ignoring the wisdom that they brought and feeling like, really, we're just going to homestead. And I see that a lot that's happening now, which is interesting, but there's, there's not really a collective identity here in the United States. And if there is one, it's capitalism. And if you're mm -hmm. not not down with that, it's sort of, you're sort of floundering, trying to figure out how to make sense of it all. It's I like, want to be more connected, like a village. Yes. It's like we've forgotten that we truly are dependent on one another and that we can't survive without paying attention to what's happening in our community around us or the community next to ours, you know, in the next village, the next village. And bringing that exactly like you said, Neelam, that idea of being more like a village. Absolutely. When we think about self-care, sometimes it really is not about that. Sometimes it's about community care. In fact, so much of it is about community care. What can I do for myself as I relate to a community, a member of my community? What can I do for others so that they can be as healthy as they can be? And how can I reach out to people who are different from me and take care of them by my own actions? Think about them when I think about myself. So powerful. And so here's where we are. We've covered that slippery slope, but what can we do about this? Let's explore some solutions or at least steps in a community care direction. You know, I think decision-making has to come from all seven chakras, right? We have these energy centers in our body and we derive a, a lot of information from each one. When we ignore our head, for instance, we're not gonna necessarily take in all the data, take in all the facts. 
We're not going to be as analytical as we, as we need to be. And I think that's dangerous because as we spoke about before, it's going to harm ourselves, but it can also harm communities. And it's going to be communities of color that are harmed the, the most. The other thing that I think about is the middle path. When I think about what we learn together, Susanna and I, in, in our Buddhist studies, we learn that there is always a middle path and that's often the right way to travel, that there's a skillful means, there's skillful actions that we can take in every moment, in every decision that we make that requires us to think about ourselves and the other person and the goal being to decrease suffering in both of us. And one way to bring that middle path into a very immediate experience for folks is if you can just imagine like kind of leaning back right now, wherever you are, and then leaning forward. And both of those may not feel quite like the most supportive things for you to do somewhere in between the extreme behind and extreme ahead is your own inner personal balance. And that balance may look different, that inner alignment from day to day or time to time, but that middle path is your path, the true, the path of your truth. Yeah, I want us to be more nuanced about the way that we collect our information and the decisions that we make from it. I want us to interrogate our sources more. I want us to be able to look at data and to be analytical and look at the facts and then I really want all of us to be able to make informed decisions that come from a place of this, this what you're talking about, the middle path, um, where we know that things are gray, where we know that things are nuanced, where we don't always have to be on one side or the other, where we can say, what's the best thing for my community in a very informed way. So powerful. And this in, you know, Eastern thought we call prajna or wisdom or yana, which is a whole path of yoga. This wisdom path is part of what it means to be in the yoga and wellness community and is part of a fuller and expanded practice to do all these things that can be the antidotes to the slippery slope. Absolutely. And if there is a philosophy that should guide our decision-making when it comes to health and wellness, it should definitely be what's going to cause the least amount of suffering for all of us, not just me, but for all of us. And with that, we'll close this episode by guiding you in a meditation. Get into a comfortable position as you allow the sounds of the bell into your heart. Through your ears, into your gut, and into your breath. Bringing your awareness to your breath, allowing your breath to be exactly how it is. not needing to change it, to deepen it. Knowing that this air that we breathe connects us all, nourishes our cells and feeds the plants as we exhale. And as we sit here together, taking in everything that we've learned, letting it fall on us as rain, knowing that this topic is such a big one, letting it land however it does, And now bringing our awareness to our brain, our mind, our heads. This beautiful power of thought, of wisdom. 
knowing that we rely on ancient wisdom as much as facts and knowledge and data from modern day science. And that this wisdom also contains future generations. Breathing into this space and thanking this wonderful organ. Knowing that the thoughts that originate from here will help guide us towards collective liberation. And now moving our awareness to our heart center. Perhaps putting your hands over your heart. Feeling the lub dub of your valves opening, closing, filling, pumping. Sending appreciation and love to this organ that feeds our entire body. Knowing there is wisdom here in this heart, that this heart feeds itself first, but does not ignore the rest of the body. Allowing yourself to appreciate in whatever way feels good. This beautiful heart center. The knowingness that love and compassion have a wisdom that is all their own. Moving now our awareness to our gut, our abdomen as it rises and falls with the breath. Showing appreciation for how beautifully complex these organs are in our bodies, digesting our food knowing that there is more nervous system tissue in our guts than there is in our entire bodies. Our guts feel everything. We know that gut feeling. Honoring the ancient wisdom that comes from this center, from this place of knowing. understanding as it comes, all of the food, the conversations, the thoughts, the media, everything that we take in is transformed here in the gut, allowing this to be true. Even without our conscious mind, giving ourselves permission to feel appreciation and love to this center of decision-making and wisdom, bringing our awareness to now all of the parts of our body, but mostly our heads, our brains, our hearts, and our gut, knowing that we can trust our entire body to make these big decisions. Breathing in gratitude for all our different ways of knowing. Breathing out, releasing anything that might be coming in the way of this seeing and knowing.
and coming back to the room or the car. Silently thanking yourself and your community. Bringing palms together in gratitude. Thank you, Neelam, for that guidance. And thank you, everyone, for listening to Radical Resilience. You can visit our show notes and join us next time to explore more about how to live well in a sick world.